So uh, the, the purpose of this, this course is essentially to talk about fire safety and performance, how to do things, best practices. Uh, we've got a multitude um, of presenters here. Uh, Dave X is the head of the fire and safety team that you're kind of? I'm the manager of fire and safety team. I've been attending Burning Man since uh, 1992. And uh, basically we're going to have a, a, a range of presenters. Eric and Marilyn are going to be talking about fire and cities. Um, and Sparky and then Doxy will be talking about how would you how would you categorize what you're going to be talking about? Uh, how to burn consumable um, fire safely. Oof, there you go. At your regional events. Yes. And so that should take about you know roughly an hour to get through those things, and we'll have about half an hour for questions. So pr probably hold those till the end until you have something that can be answered really quick. So. And well, Doxy, we poke into one of the other rooms there or somebody to check and see if there's extra chairs. It looks like we may run out of chairs. Yeah. I know you like to sit on the ground, but you want, you want to stay there? Yeah. On that note. Uh, uh, right, so I'm going to talk a little bit today with this snazzy PowerPoint presentation here about uh, fire safety at your regional yeah. event. Um, and before we even get into the fire safety part, I want to understand the difference between jackassery and fire art. Last year, I became aware that there's kind of a growing number of fire incidents happening at some of these regional events, and in my mind, they're all connected to the difference between jackassery and pre-planned fire art. So these are examples here of jackassery. <laughs> Anybody see the problem here? Right? This guy's having a good time, but that good time's only going to last for about a second or two, and then it's going to become an accident and an injury, and of course, just lighting the propane tank here. He's taking some minor safety precautions here. <laughs> These guys are well within the perimeter of doom there. And uh, this looks like a recipe for getting your face burned off when this guy blows fire into her face there. <laughs> and uh, I believe that jackassery is the kind of thing that starts with the phrase, hey, will you hold my beer for a second? Yeah. <laughs> there's no pre-planning in that. It's unplanned, spur of the moment, and there's no written or developed safety plan for what to do in case things go wrong. And that is, you guys grab a pamphlet as you're coming in the door. Grab a pamphlet. Could you look in the one that maybe this side of us? Or? Some of there's other conferences going on, so other... <coughs> and uh, so the difference between that jackassery and then and well-planned fire art is that there's been a safety plan written up, that people are acting within safe perimeters on this that the pieces are well made and meet various standards and are, are, are functional or whatever and meet certain applicable codes and that there's a safety plan for what to do in case things go wrong. People have looked down the line and said if something goes wrong, what will we do for this? Uh, speaking of well planned, I want to let you guys know that we are teaching another Flame Effects for the Artists, which is a class about LP gas safety. It's taught by myself and Eric Smith, who's the head of the LP gas board for the state of Nevada. The last class we're doing this year is coming up May 3rd and 4th in Denver. Woohoo! If you guys want more information, email me at DaveX at BurningMan.com. I'll send you the invite for that, and then you can send it out to your various regional folks. So I also wanted to talk about what I call the four responsibilities of the fire artist. First of all, we all know that if you, who here has suffered a burn? And who here still has a scar from suffering that burn? <laughs> so when you get burned, you know that that hurts. And it can be super disfiguring, and it lasts a long time. So the first responsibility of the fire artist is not to burn themselves, and not to create a scarred face or a scarred body or a permanent injury to yourself that could last a long time. The second responsibility is you don't want to burn your friends. We've all seen those people who've gotten burn scars on their face or on their body, and those are kind of horrifying to look at. And if you've taken your friend who used to be super vivacious and out in the crowd and very out and open and stuff, and you burn them and scar them in that way, you're pretty much destroying their life in, in, in more ways than one with those. Not even, even a little scar can last forever and hurt you and destroy your friend's life, and you're going to feel guilty that you did that. And imagine if you did that to a number of people, all the collective bad karma that you're taking on from that kind of act. And if you burn somebody's house down or somebody's property or whatever, you're costing somebody's house. Who here can afford to pay for somebody else's house? That's no one. So you, you can't burn somebody's property and expect that it will just be okay because it won't be okay. You'll cause tremendous damage to them because they'll never be able to replace that and, uh, and, and irreparable damage to yourself if you're sued for those kind of activities. And you as events folks 
You know, that if you ruin the, the space that you're on, those people could sue you forever, and you could work the rest of your life and never pay that stuff off. And the third responsibility is to Burning Man. If you cause a fire at your regional event, or worse yet, at Burning Man itself, who here remembers the White Snake incident with the fireworks and, and the nightclub? We all remember fire incidents. If there was one giant fire thing at Burning Man, if somebody was injured or killed due to fire in such a way that it hit the news, it would be all over the no news. They would make a heyday out of that, and probably outside officials would come in and say, you guys can't do fire stuff at Burning Man anymore. And what would Burning Man be without burning? Water Boring. It'd be the man. And who wants to just hang out with the man? Not me. Right? I want to hang out with the burning. I come from the first word in Burning Man, which is the burning man. Without burning, there would be nothing there. It would just be another stupid rave or whatever. So don't. if you create an incident with this fire, you could fuck up yourself. You could burn your friends and family, you could burn down their houses or property, cover yourself in innumerable property damage and liability issues for the rest of your life. You could wreck burning for Burning Man, which would be a complete <laughs> fuck-up, and we'd all hate you forever, and you'd probably get beaten and dosed randomly for the rest of your life. <laughs> and the worst case scenario is you'll screw up this new emerging field of fire artistry, whether it's fire performance, or fire art in general for everybody. This fire art is something that's really new. Oftentimes, as I'm a licensed fire technician in the state of California, and there's long permits and processes that are involved for going to pull these pyrotechnic shows and insurance up the wazoo. But when I come in and propose fire art, often the fire marshal's a little bit confused about what I'm even talking about, <laughs> and they'll let it slide because they're kind of unsure of what's involved, and it's a lot less, even though the process may seem very cumbersome in your area, Often the process for getting a fire permit is way less um, per permit application information that's needed that is needed for a pyrotechnic <coughs> show. But if you guys create one of these incidents with fire art, like the White Snake incident, that's going to all change, and they're going to come down hard on that, and it'll become more complicated than getting a fire uh, a pyrotechnic permit or whatever. So you could burn yourself, you could fuck up others and their property, you could screw it for Burning Man, and you could fuck it up for everybody forever for fire art and create a bad name and people will always say fire art is something that hippies do or whatever and we don't want to create that kind of imagery around this art. We want to bring our A game with this fire art. There couldn't be a more important and safe thing that you need to do in any other art form. Like going out and oil painting and shit, if you spill the oil paint it's no big deal that you spilled the oil paint or if you're a tagger and you overspray onto a window, big fucking deal, I'll scrape it off with a razor blade. But if you burn somebody's venue or hurt somebody, that's a whole different thing that you're working with here. Fire is not just an artistic medium like crayons and line drawing or photography or whatever. It's a dangerous element. So, in order to keep this fire safe at your event, you guys have to move up to creating a fire art safety team within your event itself. And to tell you a little bit about our history, of course, we all know Burning Man started as a regional event. And here there's no perimeter. This guy's just looking around here. He does know what's going on. The fire is burning and you can act safely because there's only a few people there and it's not a big deal. That guy over there could tell that guy to get out of the way because that thing is falling down. But once you start getting into hundreds of people or thousands of people, you step into a whole new scale of stuff here. And our event grew to the point where we wanted to incorporate fire on an incredible spectacle. The amount of fire performers we have in the fire conclave is record breaking. The type of flame effects that we do at Burning Man are mind-boggling and border on warfare. <laughs> and in order to do that safely, we had to create processes and reviews and stuff to make sure that all that stuff went safely and that we didn't create that white snake incident at our event and we could act responsibly. A lot of you saw that Spark movie and you saw that transition year in 96 with the Helco Tower and stuff and the guy running between the fire towers and actually stumbling into the fire and then some poor sap had to drag him out of that fire or whatever. Well, well, that's when we realized that we needed to create systems to regulate this kind of stuff. So when we were out there, we realized that we needed to self-regulate our use of fire at our event or face outside regulation. I had this moment years ago, I believe it was 1999, with the Impotency Compensation Project, the ICP. Did anybody remember that? Wrong. It was a spectacular fire cannon. But at one point, we only had teeny tiny automotive fire extinguishers, and the fire cannons themselves actually caught on fire. And the local hired fire department had to come to try to put it out, and they sprayed water on it, 
and it was liquid fuel and it spread all over the place and it became like a Keystone Fire Department moment where they're slipping in the mud with water trying to squirt out a liquid fuel blaze. The next day the sheriff and the fire marshal came over to the camp where I was working with Jim Mason on these cannons and he said to me, uh, hey, so are these your fire cannons here? And I thought, oh shit, I'm going to get arrested here, you know. I said, well, yes, they are. And he said, well, tell me what's going on with these. And he started making drawings and he got out his notebook and his paper and he started writing and he's making careful notes and the fire marshal's looking and asking me details of all this stuff. And I thought, well, we're fucked. We're never going to be able to do this again. But i got to be honest with these guys and I walked him through it. Well, at the end of that conversation, he actually slapped me on the back and he said, hey, you Hollywood guys really know how to have fun. We're going to go build one of these things. <laughs> well, I, thought not, and I thought, hey, this guy believes that I'm an expert at this in some way here. He thinks that I'm from Hollywood and that I'm a special effects guy. And this is just an everyday of fun for us out here in our, in our real jobs back in life. And a, a light bulb went on because I'd been pulling permits for various venues that I'd worked with back in San Francisco to just have candles in there. And it was a run, run through the ringer and filling out these permits. And I thought to myself, hey, we are so lucky that a fire marshal isn't now asking to come inspect this art on us. We need to create our own systems of self-regulation that in a year or two, when they catch on to what we're up to, that we will already have a system in place that either meets their standards or actually exceeds their knowledge and standards. So I began to form a team to do that work. The challenge was to provide a place that allowed us to bring the close intimacy of campfires, burn barrels, small fires that everybody likes to gather around. Everybody knows the community that a little fire builds. As soon as you light a fire barrel, people are drawn to it, they start talking, they share some beverages, stories are told or whatever. It goes way back to our human roots of gathering around the fire. Even dogs are drawn to hang out by the fire because they know that we're going to discard bones and meat there. It's, it's a cultural thing. And we also want to experience massive fires that are on scales that are unimaginable for other events or, 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 or people in their backyard campfires or whatever. We want to go way beyond that, but we also want to make sure that it's done in a safe way. So we formed a team, uh, and we looked for people to form that team, and the first people we looked to were people who had already been using this fire in safe ways, the folks who had helped with the ICP project, a group from Seattle called Cirque du Flambe, who had been performing with fire and fireworks for a long time. We looked to experienced fire performers. We then brought in licensed pyrotechnic experts. We went and sought out the people who taught and worked with LP gases in the state of Nevada. We brought them into the team. We worked with our local firefighters. We got volunteer firefighters to come on our team. We got Black Rock Rangers, and we formed a team to look at this professionally. This team was very diverse. It wasn't just one person. A lot of the gut instinct in a regional network is to say, take somebody who's a fire performer because they seem like the obvious choice and say, you're in charge of all the fire. But they don't really know anything beyond their specialty. And even if you got a licensed fire technician and said, you're in charge, of all the fire, that licensed fire technician knows nothing about flame effects and nothing about fire performance. Nobody can do this job on their own. It can only be done by a group of people working together and sharing what they know and going around a round table and negotiating different aspects of this fire inspection process. So once we formed that team, we then had to look for national standards that applied. We went to the NFPA, who is a great resource of information, and I encourage you at least one person on your regional group to join the NFPA and gain access to all their documents, whether it's the LP gas codes, NFPA 54 and 58, or the NFPA 160, flame effects before an audience, or all the codes involved in firework shows. All these documents are available to you for free as an NFPA member, and you can pull them up online and reference them. We have then looked to the stage and special effects best practices, by bringing in those pyrotechnic folks and folks who've been actually working in Hollywood on these special effects. We got in uh, licensed pyros, and then we of course needed people who had skills with welding and actual um, electrical and plumbing standards so that we could understand if this thing was wired properly and it wasn't going to electrocute people. If the plumbing pieces that were all put together to make these flame effects were actually compatible or non-compatible. And then we looked to folks who had experience and got their stories and their guidelines that they were using at their events or things that they were doing. Using the collected experience of that team and the guidelines we found, we created a process for reviewing all fire-based projects pre-event and then expecting them on site. It's very important that you gather the information about who's bringing a fire art piece 
before they even get out to there. So if you discover problems, you can negotiate with them before you get on site and before it's a day drive to wherever they got to go get parts because you've demanded that this part is not suitable for their flame effect and then it becomes a real burden to make these changes on your site. And it also gives you a time to get a feeling for who they are. If they're crazy. A lot of times in this pre-event review process, I'll see a drawing that's written in crayon and all the questions on the fire art applications are things like, why do you even need to know this? Or things like that. That's a huge red light for me. And so I know to steer away from those folks or to really heavily work with them pre-event before we even get out there. And that's when we created the performance safety team, which then became the fire art safety team, as far as Burning Man is concerned. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how it works in our pre-review of all the projects. There are some of the diagrams that we use in our inspection process, and that's the type of diagram that I like to see coming from an artist, is a good CAD drawing or a good professionally drawn image, not a crayon drawing of showing a stick man on fire and saying the fire will be here on the stick man. We want to see an actual rendering of what your effect is so it can be reviewed by competent people. So when we're looking at flame effects, when we're doing our pre-event review, we want to see their technical drawings, we want to see their site layout, where the, where the flame effect is in relationship to where the fuel is stored, in relationship to where the audience can come or is excluded from. We want to see an inventory of how much fuel. That actually is a huge telltale item. If somebody says I'm using one five-gallon tank for my flame effect piece, I know that that's of much less risk than the person who says I'm bringing 10,000 gallons of propane. First of all, you know to get back to them and <coughs> you cannot transport 10,000 gallons of propane in the back of your U-Haul truck because that's a hazard right there. And that's a red light that they don't know what they're doing. And the huge risk that's involved is storing the 10,000 gallons of propane at your event. You've then ramped up the need. If you have 10,000 gallons of propane at your event, you almost guaranteed need a rented fire department just to be able to deal with that 10,000 gallons going on fire, irregardless of the flame effects or the pyrotechnics that are involved. So looking at their inventory of fuel is a real telltale item on that. And then you should have a written safety plan. We ask you to look forward into the future and say, well, if my flame effect tipped over, what would I do in order to deal with that tipped over flame? Who would get hurt if my flame effect tipped over and how would they be hurt? And in what way can I mitigate that danger? And how can I deal with that process before I even get to the point where that accident happens? This is your job with like a crystal ball to look into the future and then have them send some photos and videos of the effect so you can understand what you're looking at. Often again, the video will show things that you never saw on the drawings. With open fire, you want to get scaled drawings and site layout of where the piece will be, where the perimeter is going to be. You want to get their burn timeline. In what order will that piece burn? When are the fuels going to be added as compared to the burning? A very common mistake is people will throw, they'll get all excited to throw on gasoline or some highly volatile fuel a half hour before the burn. This whole thing is filled up with gas fumes and the moment somebody walks up with a torch, they're 20 feet away, boom, the whole thing blows up because they didn't examine how the fuels were applied in comparison to the rest of the timeline. Again, that deals with the fuels and how they're going to be used. Nobody should be fueling anything in any sort of wood structure or effigy without somebody following behind them with a fire extinguisher to put them out in case they go on fire doing that dangerous fueling process. And then, of course, perimeter details, and the same thing goes before. What will happen if something goes wrong? What's the safety plan in case that person catches on fire? Who's going to put them out? As far as pyrotechnic shows, you're going to want, again, a site map and an inventory of pyrotechnic materials. The pyrotechnic materials and the size of those will dictate the perimeter that's needed. For every inch in diameter of a pyrotechnic device, you need so many feet of perimeter because each in, inch of diameter means that it can shoot up so far in the sky. But if it tips over to its side, it can also shoot that same amount of feet horizontally. So the size of the pyrotechnic device is going to dictate the, the, uh, the uh, perimeter that you're going to need on there. And again, you want the display timeline so you know when the devices are going out, when they're going to be ignited, what's going to happen in what order, so that there's no surprises. If there's a fire, but I know there's a portion of pyro before that, but I have to send emergency people in, often pyrotechnics, once they start, can't be stopped. So I want to know when that part of the show is over, so I know, okay, now you guys go in and rescue that guy. That pyro part is over. So the timeline is very important. And again, the safety plan for what they'll do when things are going wrong. And then you want to follow that up to make sure people are doing what they say with on-site inspections here. And here we got 
Mac inspecting this wonderful piece of pyrotechnic rocker back here. Cam. I'm going to come back in an hour and check it when you've actually got the fire extinguisher. Don't hide the fire extinguishers. That's another common one I find is people say, well, somebody will steal my fire extinguisher. Well, who fucking cares? Have three or four there. If they needed that fire extinguisher, let them have it, man. <laughs> you, know, you, you don't want to have to go wondering, hey, who's got the fire extinguisher when there's time for a fire? You've got to get that out and deal with it right then. Then you want to perform leak checks to make sure you don't have gas so people smoking or lighting a joint or whatever near the piece doesn't cause a flash fire or whatever. Go through there with the soapy water and check for leaks and then make sure it fit it fits with all the applicable codes, whether it's 54 and 58, the gas codes, or 160, or any fireworks codes that you have, make sure it's compliant with your own standards. And then, check for operator integrity. And when I say that, I mean drinking and drugs are not for people who are working with flame effects. You should not be drugged out, or when I come up to do my inspection and I see some guy greet me with a beer in his hand, I'm going to come back later. Again, I'm going to come back 12 hours later when dude is sobered up. And you can't run that until they've come there. And, and your flame effect piece is not the place for your camp cooler with, that's full of beers either. Again, like operator integrity means that they're not crazy as shit and that they're sober, right? Those are the people you may not doing your flame effects and your pyrotechnics should be your A game folks, not your B game or Tommy McTripperson or whatever. You want the right folks for the right job here. And then again, making sure that they're complying with their safety plan and all the things that they had in their safety plan are actually true. For open fire, again, you want to make sure that there are fire extinguishers on site. It seems like an oxymoron because you're going to light this thing on fire and you don't want to put it out. But if you're a fire safety person who has applied fuel to it or some poor sap has pulled somebody out of the fire and you want to put them out, you need the fire extinguisher for that. And you want to make sure it's <coughs> the right kind of fire extinguisher. You want water or CO2 to put out people. You don't want to shoot people with the yellow powder. Can anybody tell me why? Suffocate no, because you don't want to have to scrub that yellow powder out with the wire brush at the hospital. The yellow powder will go into a burn and it's very poisonous and infection material and it'll have to be scrubbed out with the wire brush at the hospital. Ouch! <laughs> and make sure that you have appropriate perimeter and staffing and that, um, you know, again, like, people will disappear right before the burn and say they're going to dinner and then all of a sudden you're ten people short on your perimeter or whatever, well then you have to delay the burn. Don't let the rushing of everybody saying, burn it, burn it, burn it, burn it, get on your nerves and make you ignite it prematurely. Wait till the right amount of people are there. Wait till the fire safety folks who you've asked to come out are all in place. Wait till all the fire extinguishers are there. And hey, here's a clue. The people who are working on your perimeter may not actually see the burn, because why? They're looking outwards. If they're looking inwards, somebody could run right by them and they're two or three feet past before they're caught by the peripheral vision. So make sure that those people working on the perimeter are properly dressed and looking backwards to see if there's any problems. And only light the thing when the weather and staffing permits. As I said, wait till the folks get out there to do the job. Wait till the wind isn't blowing. Wait till conditions are right. Even if people are chomping at the bit to get it going. Even if you have to light it the next morning. Wait till things are right. And then finally, for pyrotechnics, make sure that you have your appropriate perimeter based on the size and type of your devices. Make sure those devices are stabilized and are not going to tip over. More than once when I've attended regional devices, I've seen pyrotechnic devices playing high, high up on effigies, and as the effigies either fall down or they start shooting, those things fall down, and all of a sudden now they're shooting horizontally out into the crowd. So make sure you've wired them down. Make sure that the pieces that you're putting them on up on your effigies are the last pieces to fall, not the rickety piece of plywood that's on there with one screw and is going to be the first thing to fall. I've seen that more than once. I believe even, no, it was at Soak in Seattle. I saw a lot of pyro fall down. It's kind of scary. And then again, operator competence. Um, Donnie McDrunkerson is not the right person to be running the pyro show. It's Sober McSoberson who should be working that pyro show. And make sure that you have safe ignition methods. Like, I've seen people have a whole pyrotechnic display, and then all, and it's super competently placed, but then to light it, they take a gas can and make a trail of gas going back out to some perimeter and believe that that's going to be the best way to light their pyrotechnic display. That's the wrong way. Use fuses, use whatever electrical ignition means you need to use, or use a flare on a long stick, or whatever method you're using, but make sure it's proper and safe. <laughs> So now we're going to go into other folks' regionals and we're going to talk about how other folks are actually doing their processes here 
and talk a little bit about uh, the way that you guys are doing it and so that how that's applicable. Things we do at Burning Man may not be applicable to your events. So I believe we have Eric on first, is that correct? Yeah. And Marilyn. Eric and Marilyn are going to talk a little bit about their fire stuff, and I will help them pull up their documents here. So you want to pull that first document? Lake's fire flame. Gotta love my desktop there. I was going to include the ass crack bottle rocket in my presentation, but it was an HR issue. <laughs> so, uh, let's see, I'm Eric Griswold, just Marilyn Asese. Um, we've worked, the interesting thing is, you know, um, where, where do people come from, get into fire safety to begin with? So um, I started out in engineering and uh, done event production for a really long time, like South. Which again, there's still some similarity because you come into a venue, you do your show, you come out, and the venue is still in one piece and everybody is still in one piece. So that's a good thing. Um, I also have a background in engineering, uh, specifically risk management. I used to do uh, safety protocols for medical devices. And you think, well, what's the difference between, you know, similarity between a medical device and fire? Well, they're both really cool things, but if you do them wrong, they can kill you. So what you have to do is work out all the processes and think ahead. But like Dave was saying, you have to think ahead like a crystal ball and look at a thing and say, now imagine if that fell over. Now imagine if somebody walked past and their foot caught the hose. Now imagine that it burst into flames and they have a fire extinguisher, but the fire extinguisher is right on the device. So now the fire extinguisher is right in the middle of the flame. So how are you going to get to it to put out the flames? So. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff like that that's uh, thinking, thinking forward. So, a long time back, well, we first went to Burning Man in uh, 97, and a few years after that we came back and we thought, well, you know, someday maybe we'll start fire spinning around in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We knew this one guy who sort of knew how to do it. And so he, he, we got together some, some janky beginning poi, and this one time we went down to our uh, lakefront, and we decided we were going to spin a little bit of poi right away, or not exactly right away, but pretty dang soon, up comes like a sheriff or whatever. Oh, don't you know, you know this is like a $500 uh, disorderly conduct fine or something, you're going to just go do this. So we figured we're going to go back to the beginning, we're going to understand all the stuff about legality, fire legality, <coughs> and... Um, permitting and NFPA, we just started reading, 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 we studied all the NFPA, we studied all the codes, we studied how to write safety protocols for uh, fire spinning, uh, primarily, although we've also done, what, 45 effigies-ish? We've done about 45 effigies, typically somewhat smaller ones, we do them right in the middle of an urban environment, and we've got permission for that. And after all of our various work, we got to the point where we got um, fire spinning, legalized pretty much on all county and city property and state at all times. Uh, the county, we have to give 24 hours advance notice that we're going to do it, but other than that, we can pretty much just walk onto a piece of city property and do a fire spitting show if we follow the ex extensive <laughs> protocol that we wrote, which has got pretty much all the elements that Dave was talking about, about uh, careful fueling, controlled ignition, perimeters, operator training, safe costuming, safe extinguishment. Um, we basically went through the NFPA 160 document point by point and wrote our safety protocol to match that document point by point. So each time it asked a question, like how are you going to keep people at an appropriately safe distance, we then had to think through the answer, which then becomes part of our protocol. And that's what gets approved. So it's sort of like, uh, writing a protocol, it's sort of like reading a document, a guidance document, and then sort of writing your final exam on it that matches the, con the conditions that you're in. And this is going to be different from place to place. Mm -hmm. Some place that's doing an event in the, uh, a really dry, arid area is going to catch a lot more concern about probably stray sparks and very careful extinguishment and going over the site afterwards, hours afterwards, to, to check for sparks. Uh, much more so than like we would get in the Great Lakes region where, you know, it's probably wet, you know, we're probably dealing on wet, but it's probably raining while we're doing the burn or something. Um, so, this is just like one example. Well, actually, this is just something from um, 
It evolves, but basically the point is, and in our more modern one too, it's more like a, a check-in list that you go through with the flame effect where you check over a whole bunch of things and you lead them through the process of thinking through, is your fuel secure? What would you do right now? One of the questions we asked, what would you do right now at this moment if this thing started leaking and it caught on fire? Where's your extinguisher? What would you do? How do you get people out of the way? Um, so part of it is leading people through that. And when, when translating from, from a smaller venue to a big event, an interesting thing is at first you definitely can get a lot of pushback when people are not familiar with doing things in a safe way. And you get people saying, like, no, there's no way. There's no way you're going to get fire spinners to everybody, like, do a check-in and learn calls. You, there's no way you're going to get everybody to get a, do a check-in inspection. And then that lasts a while. And then I think people start getting, eventually they start realizing that it's for everybody's good. And they'll start to um, accept it more. Do you accept the objects or people or both? Flame um, for flame effects, but, but currently we, we, we have a two-tag system where when we check somebody in, the object gets a tag, the operator gets a matching tag, that the two things have matching numbers, so anybody coming by can say, effect number 22 is being properly manned by operator number 22, who is the operator of that effect. And, um, So let's look at a, uh, another different one. Oh, oh yeah. So um, the other thing too is oh there. So uh, actually, when after an effect is uh, an effect is checked in, it's documented photographically, and that's attached to it. That's sort of another part of verifying that that what showed up is the same thing as what we were told would show up. And it's good for the records too. It's like, we didn't just make this up after the fact. We actually have pictures of the real thing taken at that actual time. Um, but, okay, so to go forward. Oh yeah. So um, some of the things that we do when, when getting permission to do something like say fire shows or effigies or something like that around in your city. This is just some of the things that we found out that we'll summarize here. Um, one is to approach the right city officials, um, not just like wink and nod types. Uh, some people will be glad to say, oh yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead, do fire, but they don't really have the authority to do that. It would make them look good if you did, and so they'll say, oh, go ahead, you know, I, I won't say anything about it, but you haven't really gotten permission because you haven't found the right person. When we first started <laughs> out, we got bounced all over the place because, yeah, nobody really knew what flame effects were. And so it's like, I don't know, is that risk management? Is it parks? No, wait, that goes to city safety or something like that. And we went around and around a few times mm -hmm. until they basically sent us to the fire marshal and everybody said, well, if the fire marshal approves of it, I guess the rest of us are going to agree. And, and we realized that <coughs> we had to get that kind of approval, not just like a, uh, you know, yeah, sure, show up at my festival and make me look good by doing a big show and I won't, I won't say anything about it kind of permission. Um, then we determine what the permission requirements are. Um, like secondary containment, we, we follow NFPA 160 from the beginning, from top to bottom, but we had some additional requirements like fuel always being in a secondary containment fan, a pan, no fuel can touch the ground because of EPA requirements of fuel contamination in the washheads. That's just an interesting thing. We're from a place where there's lots of water and lots of lakes, so that's a, that's a requirement that comes up there that might not come up if you're in the middle of a dry, arid region. And we have to do all sorts of stuff to make sure no drop of fuel touches the ground. Um, then write a letter of understanding, um, which we did first. So, so you can frame the discussion on your terms. So when you figure out what you want to do, you can write the draft letter of understanding. If you just let it to them, let some bureaucrat come up with whatever letter of understanding might pop into the top of their head. They might say, oh, it must be done 200 feet away from everything and must be, uh, everybody must uh, wear an asbestos suit, you know, because they, they don't know. So you come up, by looking through the standards, you come up with stuff that actually matches the standards. Five. Five? Okay. Um, so let's see, then you send your copies, appropriate copies to the law enforcement officials. Um, Oh, well, then you write a protocol that, uh, right, that follows NFPA 160. And then you keep all your documents. This is one thing that we do whenever we do fire spitting shows, which we've done zillions of them. 
We, have, uh, we follow a protocol. We have a, a comprehensive checklist. We, we sign it in. Uh, we have a safety manager who takes responsibility for it. Sign it in when and where the show was. At the top of it, it says where's the nearest hospital. We have all the checklists of the stuff to go through before, checking your tools, checking your fuel, checking everything, checking your costuming. We have checklists for what happens during the show. We have checklists for the cleanup. Then we sign it and we put it in a big fat folder. And the big fat folder gets taller and taller. And we note down weather conditions too. And we note down any accident, or not even an accident, but any exception. Even if somebody drops their tool, even if gusts of wind come up, and we keep that for quality control purposes. So we can tell, for example, if a certain type of tool just keeps throwing off fuel drops, no matter all of our attempts to you know, make it not do so, maybe we have to find a better way to, to do it. So we can keep track. We can look back. And if any incident happens, we can pull out this big stack and we can say, you know, that's actually the only time that's ever happened in all of our records. And it also looks really good when you go in with a successful stack of completed fire shows, checklists that tall. Um, let's it's see. also nice to have proof that you are safe. And something where if anyone were to question your group's safety record, you have written documentation proving on hand. I can whip up my book at any moment and say, look at all the shows we've done, dozens and dozens and dozens, and each one notes where we did everything right and the small number of incidents where something may have gone wrong only slightly because we've never ever had a giant accident. But if we did, we would note it down. So anyone, no one can question your safety record because you've got it on hand. So this is something, and again, because we started out, you know, before fire was, you know, really known a lot, we sort of did a belt and suspenders safety protocol for our group, where we wanted to make sure we, we, we if anything, we over, we maybe overdo it a little bit. But so this is just like a copy of the one that we use. We have, um, it conforms to NFPA. We have a bunch of appendices, fabric burn test, flame effect test, show operator checklist, fire safety test. Uh, all fire safeties actually do a written and performance test. They're noted down that they're in good standing of having performed that test. Um, Sorry, can you share these documents somewhere? Um, we can, you know, if you want an outline of one of these, Home of Poi has one. The thing is that they're very specific to a given region, and you have to really write them to fit your conditions and what your fire marshal is all about. Um, Eric, if you want to share these documents, you can send them to me, and I can have Megs post them to the regional discussion group that, <coughs> that comes through for this. I don't know what's proprietary to your event, but if you want to share them, you can. Yes, and we'll be, we'll be putting documents on path of yeah, after, after the so. so we've got stuff about the audiences on different sides of the performers. We've got the fuels that can be used that are stated. We have the supplemental fire protection that we're bringing. We have the performers that are understanding to have to drill with the emergency response procedures as detailed. We have material safety data sheets for materials used in tools. We have operating instructions for <coughs> flame effects documentation. Uh, let's see, operating. Before each show, uh, all the, the devices are tested. Housekeeping, site inspection to, to check the site. Uh, for any kind of loose materials or anything. You know, the weirdest thing is when you do a show and they show you this big empty venue, then you show up and it's all covered with like paper tablecloths and hangings or something like that. Then we say, no, this either has to come down or we can't do the show. Um, no smoking, rehearsal, show operations, how you carry the fuel there, um, arming of the flame effect is when you've got fuel on a site and you turn your igniter on, now you've got fuel and fire in close proximity. It's like at that point the system is armed. We call out the system is armed. At that point, your mom is not on the stage taking pictures, nobody else is on the stage, just the, the group is on the stage, ready to go. And when you're done, we put out the igniters to, to make it safe again. Um, let's see, we have a whole system of double checking by uh, coming up to the igniter and asking is it all clear? The igniter says it's all clear. At that point, you clear your igniter tool. We have the emergency stop capability, which during the show, if anything starts being funny, like the wind is coming up or you lose ventilation or people start running in to your area or anything like that, we have the capability to call out like an all stop. We have gestures and calls that cause everybody to put out their tools. Um, we've got um, uh, how you put it out properly, where it goes, where you manage the fuel, after show operations of cleaning up, protective clothing, maintaining the flame effects, operator qualifications, of which essentially we have, you start with a fire training class, 
fire training class plus you demonstrate ability to spin, you can become a spinner. That plus studying the safety manuals, you can become a safety manager and you can take responsibility for a gig. Then we have safety directors, or the people that write this protocol and go and talk to the fire marshal and get it approved again. When we, whenever we do an update to this, we take it back to the fire marshal. And um, uh, let's see, then we, we added recently a section in fire breathers, which is funny because NFPA 160 is kind of silent on fire breathing, although they, we hear they intend to add more of a section to it. It's kind of a weird gray area. And you think about it, it's kind of, it's basically the most dangerous thing you can possibly do as compared to small fire tools. I mean, you, you've got this stuff that's like in your mouth, it's a chemical. Um, so we have all sorts of extra tests for wind direction, special training for fire safeties. The first thing you ask somebody who has an accident is, did you inhale any fire? Um, we have ways to disqualify people. Then we have all these appendices. I'll just show you a couple of pictures super quick. Um, oh, oh, right, right, yeah, 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 yeah the pictures. pictures. Um, let's see. Okay, so <clears throat> one thing that we do is uh, we've developed a couple of sort of standardized gig boxes, which we're, uh, and we're now miniaturizing. That's kind of a larger size one. Uh, it pretty much contains everything that you need to go to uh, to do a show. This is like some of the stuff that's in it. We, uh, we do bring an extinguisher, but we use a bicarbonate only extinguisher that just it doesn't shoot ammonium bicarbonate, it, it uses sodium bicarbonate. We use a propane torch for a controlled igniter because you can, even with a heavier fuel like lamp oil, you can just, you can light up instantly if you hold it over a propane flame. And also if you declare some kind of an emergency, you can turn that right off. First aid kit, of course. We're working on a system of black and white towels where the black towels are used to extinguish tools, the white towels are used to extinguish people. Why? Because when you extinguish a bunch of tools with a black towel, how much vapor is in it now? Now you go to put somebody out with this fuel-soaked towel, who knows what's going to happen. Yeah. So, and then you, and once you've used the white towel once to put somebody out, you're going to know because it's not going to be white anymore. Um, this is some of the stuff that's in it. We've got a weight-based fueling system with a scale. We've got a little bucket where you can rest your fuel poi or bring them back when they're cooling down. And what we like about the weight-based fueling system, what makes it, helps make it safer is, um, there's always a question of tools throwing off drops when you spin. So what you do is you put your poi into the, the weight bucket, you push the little pump, which is on the side there, and it goes through a tube and it dispenses it, and then you simply dispense the fuel until the scale reads, let's say 7.5 ounces or whatever is the correct weight for your poi. You now take out the poi, it's completely ready to spin, no drops will fly off, even if you started with it half full, um, which is always a question, how much you add when your poi was half full to begin with, you snuffed out before. This way by using weight base is always the same, it only takes about 10 seconds to fuel each one when you use a, a weight base system. So, um, let's see, one and other thing. System and it's a closed system too. So and it's a closed system. You drop something flaming in your gig bucket and nothing will explode. Because it's all sealed with that thing, if you kick the whole gig bucket over, it's not going to spill. Maybe like a little drop comes out the end. We're also doing experimentation with human safe uh, fire breathing fuels because it sort of puts off a, a risk management official when you come up and say, and now step 11, the guy takes the bottle that says deadly poison, <laughs> do not drink, and puts it into his mouth as a routine part of the show. So we've been doing various testings with things like mineral oil, Everclear, or actually a mixture, and also trying to find um, human safe coloring agents that can um, give you a nice, a nice bright color. Um, yeah, you can use cornstarch too. Um, but if you're going to use, a lot of people use a liquid fuel. So we're looking into safe alternatives because you can get <laughs> mineral oil that's like for, it's like a baby laxative, but it's USP rated. If you drank it, you're not going to get all full of benzene or something like that, and it's going to pass the inspection that essentially everything that we're permitting as a fire spinning fuel is something that's on the generally recognized as safe list as a food. Or, or a uh, supplement. Eric, do you have a contact email that people can email you for more information about <coughs> fire? Yeah, Eric G at burningman.com. I guess that's all the time we have for. Yeah, we're trying, to rush, trying to rush through all these so we can get some questions in at the end. Important to remember that every AHJ is their own autonomous unit. They can choose to accept NFPA standards in their local area or they can choose to pretend that they don't exist. If your AHJ says that I only allow flame effects that are painted in the color red rather than flame effects that are colored blue, he has the right to say that in his area, 
and you create a big argument with him saying that you're insisting that there's standards that say that you can do this is only going to get you in trouble. You can help to educate them a little bit, but don't come from a pompous standpoint and shove your things down his throat. I've heard every kind of foolishness from so many different fire marshals, and it's completely their right to say that. We had an event that wouldn't allow smoking at the event and wouldn't allow flame effects, but they're completely okay with homemade fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know who you're going to get. I want to Next. clarify a little bit. Um, flame effects. He's not talking about propane, LP. So he's so. Just so you know that there's a big difference, and there can be a confusion in that. So everything he's talking about definitely has to do with conclave, because he's really good at that, and Miss Brandlin is his amazing assistant. I don't know what he does without her. So they're totally pros on that. So just so you know that there's a difference in case you're not sure about that. Tell me real quick, you know which way to go if you had to get out the door? You would go that way, right? Well, you would go the way where the fire is not at, first of all. Uh, second of all, your actually marked exits are down this hall. Do you know where the closest fire extinguisher is in this building right now where you're at? 20 feet down this hall is a fire extinguisher on the left-hand side. All right? Be prepared. That's what I'm here to talk about. Also, who's checked the uh, batteries in your uh, smoke alarm before you left the house? You read my note, check your batteries. So I put a little note out there. I hope you caught that. Thank you for checking your uh, smoke alarm. All right, I'm Sparky, and uh, some of you might know me coming up here to talk about art in the past, and uh, a little bit has changed in my life. November, I had a heart attack, almost died, and uh, I decided to change course of action. I resigned from the LLC, not because of my health. It was just time for me to go, and now I'm focused on building a regional fire corps. So I'm going to be working with you on this in the future. But today I've got to talk about three things very fast. I'm going to talk about how Flipside, that's the Austin burn event, um, deals with consumable fires. I'm going to talk about what is the difference between consumable and combustible. This is just terminology we use. Uh, why you should adopt ICS and training in your program. I'll define what all that means later. And then I'll touch on this regional fire core really quick. All right, first of all, um, I'm talking about the, uh, how we do it. So uh, combustible versus consumable. Um, by the way, I'm very low tech um, about all of this projection stuff. Um, and I intentionally did it uh, right now because I'm thinking the way firefighters think. Um, and by the way, I'm going to be bringing you the perspective from part of your fire safety team that Dave was talking about in one of his slides, the guys in the yellow shirts. That's the ESD fire safety team. They coordinate with Dave X and all this planning goes into play. Um, you need to find similar type people in your region. So consumable, combustible, uh, for us, combustible, of course, or fuel-based, uh, propane, gases, all of the stuff we've been talking about already. For us, consumable are fiber-based things like wood, and we don't really like to burn pretty much anything other than that. Um, so I'm going to talk mostly about uh, consumable. Um, before I go into that, I'm going to tell you quickly about our team and what we have to work with. Currently, our staff on our fire department, that's what we call the fire, uh, Pyropolis Fire Department, so there's no confusion and chain of command as to what our purpose is. So uh, there's, you know, there's fire art safety teams, there's fire teams, there's safety teams. Um, we keep it just like a volunteer fire department. That's our purpose and role in the whole mix that Dave's talking about. Um, I'm fortunate. After 15 years of uh, burning, um, our team is developed into a retired fire marshal from a city. Uh, currently acting two training captains, one a safety officer, 18 year veteran for the city of Austin. Uh, a hazmat specialist, um, that's actually Chango, some of you may have met him out on the playa. Um, I have uh, two line firefighters, both of them are senior firefighters with 10 plus years. I have uh, four volunteer firefighters on our team that serve in various capacities from officer down to line firefighters. We've got two red dot rangers, I'll talk a little bit about that. And now a new mix that we've added is seven uh, citizen bucket brigade team members. Um, that makes a total of 19 on my team. I'm pretty fortunate for my burn events to have that many people. However, that's not enough. And uh, when you're uh, in charge of fire safety and planning, um, sometimes having this enough personnel, you just can't have enough. So how does Burning Man or Burning Flipside do this? Um, we have to work with a whole bunch of other people. So we work with our city planning, we have to work with our medics, we have to work with our rangers, our art department, our site operations. 
We have to work, have to work with our landowner, uh, the sheriff's department, and the county fire marshal and fire departments. Uh, we have two jurisdictional fire departments, and we're right in between, so we don't know which one would respond, but we'll get one of the two if we need them. Um, our apparatus uh, that we have, a 3,000-gallon tanker that we rent comes on site. We also have skid units that are uh, inside uh, one, a two-ton pickup. That's our main fire truck. You've seen those at Burning Man. And uh, we also have a mobile skid that's on a gator uh, for a real quick, uh, quick uh, rapid response. Uh, all of our uh, golf carts for our staff have fire extinguishers put on them, so everyone's a firefighter in our opinion. So going to our burn events. Well, you, you got two different kind of consumable fire burn events. Obviously, your big plan one, your effigy. Um, and then you've got your other artists uh, who are going to bring something. Um, both of these require us to think in incident command system modules. So we take every incident just as if it were uh, an accidental fire. We think that way because we plan for the worst. Um, and our, uh, our department uh, likes to get involved in it to a certain degree and then they still want all of the artistic expression and the city to thrive and be alive and not be too burdened with a bunch of rules and policies so we're very careful of that so a lot of this is happening behind the scenes first thing is the inventory of the art and the fuel like we said before we do uh, operate with something a little bit different burning flip so we have something called a burnable art contract i'll make this document available for you um, it basically is an educational tool for the artists to know you have some responsibilities. You can't just throw a match and have fun. Uh, so you've got to play along with us. And uh, also in this uh, inventory, is, uh, it's important for our placement. We've got to place the art in the right places so we don't have it too close to camps to start Swiss cheese in a bunch of tents with embers or uh, getting a fuel problem too close to the next guy and we, we make things catastrophic for ourselves. Planning, 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 that's our next phase. So we do a lot of pre-event planning. Um, to help us coordinate this, we created a position when I was on the LLC called the Burn Night Coordinator for our big effigy burn. Um, so that person is a cat wrangler. They're basically getting all of us to check off, sign off, and work together to plan for our, our big burn event. We have a burnable art lead who's uh, in charge of that contract. So we've got the Burn Night Coordinator dealing with more of the effigy, the big burn night, and then all the other nights that we want to burn other art, this other person is kind of their liaison, their lead to our bureaucratic maze. So they're going to help you, the artist, make sure that your uh, art gets burned. Um, also, uh, a separate planning session or group of sessions is our safety manager. We, we have nine managers or area facilitators that deal with everything in our city. And uh, our safety uh, AF facilitator is going to bring all of the safety teams together and help coordinate. And I'll talk just a real quick sidetrack on something in that. Oh no, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Next, our, our third phase is execution. So we're down to, now we're going, we're at the event, we want to start burning. We did all our planning, we got our ducks in a row. Um, so we have a burn day meeting. Um, it's a mandatory two meeting for all people involved, from the artist down to the safety line, to city planning and site operations. We may have to move things out of the way, because as you know, as regionals, we don't have the luxury of a lot of land. All of our stuff's close together, so sometimes we have to move shit out of the way so we can start having fun and uh, clean up our room a little bit. So uh, our site operations is very involved in burn night uh, planning. So we have a noon meeting. We sit down and we're looking at, is this all doable? Um, is the weather good? Are we in a burn ban? That's one of our challenges right now in Texas. The whole state is red flagged. Um, right now it's under high risk red flag, humidity is low, or high, and, or low rather, and uh, everything's fucking dry. So uh, pretty scary right now to try to even have a burn event. Then we have, uh, after that, we have a 6 o'clock go, no go meeting. By this time we're now really committed and uh, everything's got to happen. Things got to happen on the effigy, we've got to start doing <coughs> stuff, fuel and pyrotechnics need to be brought in, coordinating, uh, all of the teams and uh, cordon off the area creating perimeters. Um, and then uh, each individual team has its own muster point after uh, time after that six o'clock call. So for fire, which is what I'm going to talk about, um, we start getting our team together at seven o'clock. So seven p.m. and we may not be burning till midnight. That you know the 
the window changes. We start with dark, dirty, and then you know, the wind is not right. We got to wait. So we're very flexible. You have to be mindful of that as a manager. You got to deal with the team. You guys that tried on the bunker jacket or the turnout gear, um, was it hot when you put it on? Yeah, it warmed you up like really quick. You can imagine sitting around in one of these uh, all evening waiting for your chance to watch a fire because thank goodness we don't have too many accidents and we don't have to run in there and pull somebody out, right? Awesome. Well, it gets hot, so you have to plan for that. So our teams muster up and uh, get their uh, game plan together. Our big thing is getting all our apparatus and equipment ready. It should have been checked out two days ago before the burn, by the way. So uh, I cannot t stress enough check out all your apparatus when you first hit the field um, and uh, two other, all the other departments. Um, we did individual breakout sessions for those departments. We did cross trainings. We actually put everybody on the hose, fired up the pump. They got to feel the, the force and the pressure, which is really invigorating. And um, then we uh, spent the last day, Sunday, doing ICS drills. And we actually put people in the situation and see how they panic and fall apart. And then we are analyzing that. Um, I'm going to talk to the people who produce safety side for us and see if they're open to uh, allowing you to come to watch. We're, we're trying to do that and do it in a way that's not interfering with their goals. Um, but I would like to invite some of you to come and so you can take safety side home and do your version of it with your whole team. And that's why we're doing a safety event because we learned about them doing safety side. So we decided to do um, And that's my goal. I'm going to uh, stay alive. I changed my diet, I'm exercising again, and uh, my cholesterol jumped down 100 points. Yeah. All right. yeah, I've got one last thing I want to say, and then I'll write that down. The well, last thing I want to say is something I think is real exciting. If we do this right, guys, and the rest of our colleagues who didn't come here do this right, I intend for us by next year to make a proposal to Burning Man Project, because who was here last year when they said we're prepared to turn the guns the other way? Instead of forcing our energy inward to the Black Rock Desert, we're going to go to the region. Remember that? Yeah. Introduce the project to us. So I immediately, the bell went off in my head. Good. Buy me some fire apparatus shit, <laughs> motherfucker. <laughs> so I, I'm going to propose that we buy and have them uh, purchase for us five skid units. They look like this. You can pass them around. They're very lightweight, four people can lift them up, uh, empty it, put them back of a two-ton truck, fill it full of water, add some uh, fuel to the pump, and you now have a fully functional fire truck that will put out probably anything that you would set at a small regional fire. I propose that five of these be placed regionally around the country, and when it's time for your burn event, you have in your budget to transport it and bring it to your event. We can work out the details of this stuff later. And uh, you would have a fully functioning fire uh, apparatus, a piece of equipment on site. Some of you are fortunate. You have people, uh, burners who show up with fire trucks and, you know, all kinds of cool shit. That's cool. But this is something you can count on, depend on, and know that every trained firefighter that has signed on to this program knows how that pump works and how the apparatus works. There's no second guessing. And when it comes to fire, and as what David said, we cannot afford to mess this up. There is no second guessing on protecting you the public, uh, the property, and uh, uh, sustainability of our events. We're, de we're dealing with something very dangerous. Firefighters take this very serious. Uh, we know we can die when we go in there to save a life. We know that. It's not being superhero. This is just a commitment that we made to do this. And uh, we want to do that safely. So I will continue to walk around here in the hotel with my little sign and my helmet. Scaring the shit out of the hotel staff <laughs> by uh, trying to recruit. So meet us for lunch to talk more about that. The last thing I want to say is you earned your fire merit badge by attending. So this is it. Pass them around. Stick it wherever the hell you want. <laughs> also got a card up here. I'll write that information here, and now I want to pass the torch over to my good friend, Miss Doxy. <laughs> Tomorrow, I have an SOP for um, the Detroit Fire Guild, which I used to manage. Uh, it's willing and ready to share, and I have a ton of SOPs from other um, fire troops as well. So that's it's there. So foreigners could be a little bit different with you guys, but we will, we'll it's all going together. All right. So I'm from Lakes of Fire, uh, which is uh, the Great Lakes Regional, and we are kicking butt and taking names. Dragging. Uh, last year we were 1250. This year we're ramping it up to um, 1500, and 
because of that, we know now that the more we know, the safer we have to be, you know, and we have to be able to improve what we're doing at all times. Uh, a few years ago, we had a team, and we, uh, it was great for what it was, but now we have bigger and better artists who are bringing more dangerous artwork, and a lot of it is the Great Lakes is amping up some flame effects, as in propane, that is above and beyond what our team even has knowledge for. So this has encouraged um, a few of us on the team to join the team, so we asked Eric and Marilyn if we could join the team so we can improve the team because not everybody has the knowledge for every item on your team. You need to know that. You know, know what you're strong at, stick to what you're strong at. But if somebody has something that is better than you, someone's doing something better than you, step aside and let them do it because they're bringing experience and expertise and an element, an element that your team needs. So be open to that. Um, so in Lakes of Fire, we have a conclave lead, we have open fire lead, we have effigy lead, and we have um, FE lead, flame effects as in propane. So we're, we're, we're growing them all the time and we're bringing people on. Like if we meet somebody who did flame effects, like we did this last year, um, we didn't have a strong flame effects as in or propane. When I use the word flame effects as propane, when Eric does it, it's, it's conclave. So just so you know, it's, it's all about semantics. We need to find language that works for all of us. So we didn't have a strong enough inspection team, so we pulled on somebody, Kruger, from our area. Now this year, we're actually pulling on people who created Flame Effects last year. We're like, hey, you want to be on our team because you know what you're doing. So we've made our team stronger. And we're going to continue to do this because it's more important. Like Sparky said, there's never enough people to do this. So again, find your strong points. No one owns a role. If you start to get ownership of it, we're going to have problems. It's all about like you know sharing the information and making sure that it's, it's shared out. What we do at Lakes Fire is we do a lot of pre-relationship or pre-event relationships. So we have the forms. We have, a, we have this insane document online where somebody created it where if you do fire effects, boom, it's going to open up this, this new pod. If you do, you know, conflict, it opens up this one. If you do open fire, it opens up this one. So we're gathering all of this information ahead of time. It's kind of like what I do with Dave, um, pre-burn now, is we have interviews with people and we're just creating relationships with them. So we know them. Even though, like, most of us are friends, we still need to talk. Some of them we don't because there's always new burners coming in. So start these relationships, start asking the questions. Keep your spreadsheets. As Dave said, roulette revolution. There will be no revolution without the spreadsheet. Post-it notes will blow away in the wind. <laughs> <laughs> this man has taught me the importance of spreadsheets. <laughs> so, um, so, with, um, <coughs> so did, is anybody here working with propane? Yeah, that's awesome. It's a magic gas. <laughs> it's been a magic gas. And how many of you do um, open fire, like small effigies? And how many do big effigies? Are you on your teams? I mean, are you just creating them, or are you on the teams to help um, organize them? Yeah, you, you're, you're everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm doing open fire, and you have to create relationships with IE, the, um, the artists, throughout the burn, again, before the burn. So you're creating, knowing what they're doing, and you're helping them to create their perimeters. You're helping them to know like, what fuels they're using, how big their structure is. We have limits now at Blake's Park for learning. Like, over 10 feet, we're not doing it for small fires, because we don't have the capacity to do it yet. So you just you set your limits on what works. It's kind of like the core project, 20 by 20 by 20. Ours are 10 by 10 by 10, because we know that we don't have enough space. So we're limited by where our location is, which our location is pretty awesome now. Um, good for your perimeter team is to create relationships with your rangers. Your rangers are a great perimeter team. Use them, incorporate them, you know, train them with you. Get, you know, but don't let the, the team who's building that, that fire think that, oh, it's just going to be the perimeter team. That. They need to educate their own team and have their own team. So you can educate them too with you and your rangers and yourself. Um, create a relationship with your LEO. Um, um, Eric started a relationship with our um, fire marshal. His name's Roland Bart. And uh, I talk to him every month. Brooks. Brooks. Yeah, Owen Brooks. I talk to him every month. He gives, he gives me a call or I give him a call because I am making sure that we have a really good relationship with him. And it's just really important that we do this. Um, and his team, so with like, you know, we're going to start relationships with this team. We're doing a safety weekend at the end of this month. Roland's team is coming to meet with us and play with us. I mean, we're pretty stoked about that. So, you know, he's, he's excited. He's like, well, every weekend works for you guys. We'll figure it out. They're a volunteer team. Once, I, you know, I walked up to him and I'm like, we have so much to learn from you. And he looked at me he's like, we have so much to learn from you. And I was like, oh, like that was a compliment. And so if we're creating these, these relationships, it's going to help all of us. And this year I want to invite them to be on our open fire um, I want them to be in the other ring if they want to, because why not? They want to play too, the pyros. You know? So I think extending the invitation after this weekend that we have is going to be great, and I'm pretty stoked that I have a feeling they're going to do it. Um, 
we, you're, he's talking about pyrotechnics. We do not have anybody like deal with that except a vendor. We, we hire that out professionally. We don't hire a lot of things out professionally, for our bodies, obviously. Um, but, um, <laughs> We just have a vendor who does it, and he's 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 slowly becoming a burner, which is pretty cool. We're for Mr. Boom. Um, <laughs> timelines are really important for your safety plans. Obviously, we we know this, um, but we also have to remember that we're burners. Shit happens, and that timeline is not to be in concrete. When things happen, you have to make sure that that thing is taken care of, that all your team members are in place, that all you that you're all communicating, especially your your team leads and your fire safety. You're not communicating. There's going to be a breakdown, and it's going to get dangerous. So we cannot have that, you know, on any team. We all know this. So everybody needs to communicate. No fire gets you know, done until everybody's in their bunker gear. Everybody's doing the eye communication and you know using the you know, code words if you have them. So money will burn, whatever. Um, we need level heads. We obviously know this. Not everybody can work well under pressure. Some people are a lot better pre-event. And you know, doing whatever it takes, and then it's okay to change walls, you know, on site. Some people are much better when shit hits the fan. You know, not everybody has that like to function properly. Why are you pointing? Oh, no. <laughs> so you're not pointing at me. Okay. We're pointing the stickers back here. Um, so let's see. Sparky came to Lakes of Fire last year, and I am so grateful that he did. I knew him and met him at one of these things once and then he came to our event. And because of what he did by coming to our event with his bunker gear and helping us, we are now creating a fire department that's a fire. Because the fire, the FAST team, fire our safety team, it's not the same as a fire department. And we now, because of, we're protecting the community, we're protecting the region, we're protecting all fire artists. This isn't just about us, it's about our ego, like I can do this. So, you know, we're kind of under his tutelage a bit for how to create the ESD. And our own team, you know, the whole Lakes of Fire team, there were some people on that team who weren't very happy with that. They, they, had, hard, they had some struggles with it, but we worked through it, and we are so stoked to have a team. We have a, fire, or we have a um, fireman running that team. He's brand new. He's been running our burns for like a few years. He's been on our team. So we have three firemen, we have um, two medics, and we have volunteer firefighters that are now on our ESD team. They are working very close with medical. They are also working very close with rangers. But we're not shutting it off because that's a, little, a bit of the fear of some of our team was like, well, it's just them doing that thing. And so we're, we're also making sure that, you know, if you guys, even if you don't have the training or you're not qualified, you don't have the badges, you can still learn to be on this team because we don't want to shut it down because the more people we know who are trained, the safer we all are. So, time check. Um, we Good. are at 1110. Okay. Check about. So, yeah. if you guys are really interested in what he has to offer, you know, it's really working well with Lakes of Fire. I mean, we're just starting it out, but we have, you know, it's it's strong. This, the, the safety training that we're doing next week is actually being run by our ESD team, and we're opening it up to people in FAST and people who are, you know, certain people in the community. We're keeping it small the first year because we're like, we're not sure what we're doing, you know? So we want to make sure that we all have the same language, that we create these command incident centers, and that we're training everybody, and then we want to make it get bigger and bigger. So I think next year it would be great if... You know, if you guys write this down in your little sheets too, if you're interested in him doing a full pod, I think this is this is strong enough that all of our, like I said, it's a template. You know, you don't have to see exactly thumbs up, right? Uh, I want to go to that. <laughs> so, um, so it, it's not something that you have to do it this way. It's not with directions, but this is a really great guideline, and I'm so thankful that he's given us this guideline, and he's open to asking tons of questions. So I think we can do this together. So. Yeah, add one thing I didn't say. Um, we also do a training event. We just did. Oops. All right. Uh, so one, two, three. Ouch. Oh, yeah. That's the result of Jack Astor. Oh, 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 that's correct. Oh. 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 O
Yeah, I mean it is different because uh, although in both cases here, essentially what you're looking for is a one is a one time permission for that that one event on the bus. But I mean, if you go in with a, a nice big procedure and you say, you know, look at this, all of our people are checked. We do this, we do this, we've got this, we've got this, and we will do that. We, we do that every time that we perform, and we will always do that every time. We've got extinguishers here. We know where all the fire exits are. They're written in our plan. Um, that impresses them. You know, they like to hear that. Also, I think adding that you send in your most competent person to do that discussion. You don't send in the person in uh, feather boa, gummy bear, uh, bra, you know, kid utility skirt, Trippy McTripperson in to make that negotiation. You send in Nikki McDormelson for yeah, that, yeah. to do like, that uh, negotiation. Like, and you send them in with a few dollars or whatever like as well. Procedure right here, and we'd like to lay this out, and then that makes, that makes a good impression. Just so we can get through questions, uh, you know, we'll try to also one off uh, with number two. Yeah, get somebody to speak their language. Also with fire spinners, there's uh, you catch somebody <coughs> spinning fire, they're like, oh, I've been doing this for years. I'm great. Look at me do it. And I'm like, how old is your, your? Yeah, you're great. How old is your equipment? Yep. What's going to happen when that flies off into the crowd? And they're like, oh, somebody will put it out. No, that's your responsibility. And that's a quick way to defuse them. Like, yeah, you're fabulous. How old's your equipment? Okay. Uh, so number three, uh, Zoltan from Alberta. Uh, I propose, and I, I know it was be about resources, but what about assembling a third, safety third, uh, super fantastic audit safety team that makes it, made it, like you just said, you visited your event and you they benefited so much. Have like three or four key people that are really good at their areas and we can figure out some sort of resource sharing thing and you can actually come to our events and hang out with us and you know show us if we're missing something vital That's because great. we don't know until shit goes sideways we think we're doing these great things and every time there's a conference it's great but to actually have someone on site would be such a benefit as long as the med is paid for okay <laughs> We're allocating resources right now for just those kind of programs in our also our educational program, which we're just developing at Burning Man. Your feedback back to your regional groups is the things that are going to sway these kind of budgetary decisions. They send me around to several regionals event, and we're rolling my flame effects class into the educational program now. And your comments that you want these kind of fire safety trainings are what's going to allow for us to budget in the next budget cycle at Burning Man to send these kind of assets around. We would love to do this, but the money's coming right out of our pockets right now as we do these kind of programs. And so to get your feedback back to the regional group is then going to put pressure back onto the board and the various people with the big pockets of yeah, earning yeah, it. But no, that comes from us too. Actually, okay. hang on one second. I just want to check everyone. Put, make sure you fill out the feedback form. It's a good yeah, segue. I was just going to say that. Make sure that put you put that on goes the feedback yeah, form. Yeah, this aren't really right hard here. enough for this. There was only about half as many. Write a piece, grab a piece of paper yeah, and make exactly. it. Just grab right, a piece of paper. I had some more hands up. So and one. One, one more thing. We are going to start uh, at 1130 downstairs. It's 1123 now. Let's let this go. Yeah. And then come and talk to us exactly. at lunchtime. We'll okay. have our little easel set up here with more information. The Flame Fix class is coming up in Denver. Send me an email if you want more information about that. You can then send it to your group.